Hey guys, I'm Andrew Mace. I'm the student pastor here at Seabreeze, and I'm glad that you've joined us today. Before our service today, I want to encourage you to think how you can stay engaged and participate in this worship service today. So in preparation, consider what things you can do to make sure that you are participating in the worship service. Maybe go grab a cup of coffee. Stay focused by putting your cell phone on silent or on do not disturb. Do what you need to to remove some distractions so that you can really focus on this time and hear from God. For me and my family, what we do is we have four young kids at home. so. We get them set up before we, we get started with the video. Once we get them set up, we actually bring the family together, we sing a few worship songs, and then once we get to the main portion of the video to hear from Pastor Bevan, we hit pause, we go get them set up, get them going, and then we come back so we can focus. Whatever it is for you, I encourage you to think about what you need to do to remove those distractions so you can focus. Maybe you even need to hit pause right now and say a quick prayer and ask God to speak to you during this time. Again, we're so glad that you're participating here with us this morning for our worship service. Let's sing together. Welcome to our online worship service. We're so glad that you joined us today. We're going to sing a couple songs together. Uh, these first two songs are all about God's power and all about how uh, He can work through uh, situations when uh, we really don't know how He could possibly work. So uh, join us as we sing these songs together. You're the only answer to the darkness You're the only right among the wrong You're the only hope among the chaos You are the voice that calls me on and Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night your name is power over darkness freedom for the captives mercy for the broken and the hopeless your name is faithful in the battle glory in the struggle mighty it won't let us down or fail us your name is power your name is power I know it is written hope is certain I know that the word will never fail I know that in every situation you speak the power to prevail Louder than every lie, my sword in every fight, the truth will chase away the night. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty, He will let us down or fail us. Your name is power. Your name is power. 
When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. When you speak, you scatter darkness. Light arrives in heaven, opens. Holy Spirit, let us hear it. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty, He won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power over darkness. Your name is power in the chaos. God who makes the giants fall You bring down the walls of Jericho You're the God who gives the miracle We believe You're the God who parts the ocean wide just to bring us closer to your side You're the God who brings the dead to life We believe, oh we believe God how great you are Great things you have done For everything we've seen there is more to come Every victory Every battle won For everything we've seen There is more to come We are confident in all your ways Cause we know you never make mistakes God you fill us with the greater faith We believe God how great you are Great things you have done For everything we've seen there is more to come Every victory Every battle won For everything we've seen There is more to come And all of our hope in All of our trust in All of our future in the God who never fails All of our faith in All of our strength in All of our future in The God who never fails All of our hope in All of our trust in All of our future in the God who never fails All of our faith in All of our strength in And all of our future in The God who never fails oh, oh, oh. God how 
great you are Great things you have done For everything we've seen There is more to come Every victory Every battle won For everything we've seen There is more to come There is more to come There's always more to come Sing that chorus one more time. God, how great you are. Great things you have done. For everything we've seen. There is more to come. Every victory. Every battle won. For everything we've seen. There is more to come. Before Bevan's message, I wanted to inform you about a few things that we've been doing in the student ministry. Our goal is really to partner with parents and families and be a resource to be a help to you during this time. Each week, we encourage students to join in with their families during this time of worship. And we even provide discussion questions and a prayer that you can say with students after this is over. One of my new favorite things that we have done has been a Sunday night live stream on YouTube for students and their families. We can get together on Sunday nights at 7 p.m. in the chat room as we interact live through the video and through the chat room. It's, it's a ton of fun. Uh, basically, we're still able to play games, we're able to do some challenges where students can win prizes, and then we can really dig down and address topics that are specifically designed to help students while at home. This is something that we do on Sundays at 7 p.m. on YouTube. Uh, I, I encourage you to join us. We're starting a new series tonight called I Have a Question, where we're actually looking at specific questions that students have about life, current events, and the Bible. I hope you guys join us and tune in. Another thing we've done have been free survival bags. We created a bag for junior high and high school students with free movies, popcorn, some brain teasers, and a Bible reading plan to really help lift spirits at home. We delivered it. Uh, it's, it's been super fun to see students get to enjoy that and to get to do that for them. And one of the most helpful things that we have done in this time has been to continue our student growth groups. If you're a student, the best way to stay connected and encouraged is through one of these growth groups. They meet on Wednesdays at 7 p.m. And basically, we get together to discuss the different things that are happening in your life, whether it's the pressures from school, from living full-time at home 24-7, or trusting God with the future that is unknown to us. This is a great place for you to come with your questions, to hear how your friends are doing, and to really stay connected and encouraged. If you're curious about what these groups look like, I really encourage you to check us out on the website. This is a great week for, for you to try us out since we're starting a new series, literally designed for you to ask questions. All the information on how to join these groups when they meet will be on the website. It's the youth page on Seabreeze.com. If you'd like to follow along with today's message, go ahead and open the YouVersion app, select events, and then type in Seabreeze Church you'll find a place where you can take notes and then follow along with Bevan's message. If you'd like to give, you can do that today through our website. And again, we're really glad that you're participating with us today. I think you'll really benefit from today's message. We are considering the power that is resonant in the small days of our life. Nine weeks ago, all the big days that we had circled on our calendars were either canceled or postponed. And what we're left with are the small days. Days when, well, we're in our homes, working and passing the time. Now, we're used to leapfrogging from one big day to the next, kind of enduring the small days in between. And while we circle the big days on our calendar, God tends to circle the small days. And that's because it's in the small days that our lives are really built. Small days have two very important powers. First of all, they have the power to set direction. 
We have the ability every single day to decide whether or not we're going to do what God wants us to do. And that determines the direction of our life. The second power is the power to make progress. Every single day, we are making progress. We are advancing. Either we're advancing towards a destination that is good or a destination that is not good. Now, we can squander these small days for two big reasons. First of all, we can get distracted and pursue the things that are unimportant, and that messes with our direction. Or we can get discouraged and we kind of slow down and maybe sit down and stop moving, and that messes with our progress. So God has given us a daily checklist in the Bible to keep us on track and moving forward. These are the verses in the Bible that tell us what requires our daily focus and our daily effort. Today we turn our attention to the top agenda on God's daily to-do list, and that is the agenda of salvation, saving people. Here's what we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. As God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you, and in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. What does it mean, first of all, to receive God's grace in vain? Well, it means that you accept God's offer of forgiveness, but you don't share it. It doesn't move beyond you to other people. God never intended his offer of grace, his offer of forgiveness to to end with you or to end with me. It's not enough for us to benefit from his grace, to be grateful for his forgiveness. It would be given to us in vain if we are not now a part of helping other people find the salvation, the forgiveness that we have found. So how often should we be ready to do this? Well, every day. Why every day? It's because it says now is the day of salvation. In other words, if you're reading this, just know now, today is the day of salvation. Now, we tend to think of saving as a big day event, you know, a launch the search and rescue helicopters kind of moment. But for God, saving is a small day activity. It's an everyday focus. It's an everyday priority. The reason is that we are all living in in an era of time referred to as God's favor. This is the time of God's favor. What does that mean? Well, we all woke up this morning with a different set of circumstances. For some of us, the circumstances were favorable. For others, not so much. But the favor of God doesn't show up primarily in whether we're having a good day, a favorable day, or a bad day. The favor of God shows up primarily in the fact that we are alive today. Now, that doesn't feel like much of a favor because, well, we've been alive every day so far. It doesn't seem that unusual. We tend to really not have an understanding of of the predicament that we find ourselves in because of our sin. If it wasn't for God's favor we'd never see a sunrise because of our sin. Why? It's because God is holy and we are sinful. Holy means, by definition, to be without sin. Sin has to be absence in order for holiness to exist. Holy isn't just God's preference, it's his nature. What's the difference between preference and nature? Well, let me say, for example, when I order a salad, I ask them to take out the onions. That's my preference. It's not my nature. It's my preference. In other words, I don't like raw onions. Now, if they forget to take the onions out, I can still go ahead and eat my salad. It's not going to harm me. But if I was allergic to onions, well, now we'd be talking about my nature, not my preference. And when it comes to sin, God doesn't just prefer that we not sin. It's his nature to be opposed to sin. In a sense, It'd be accurate to say he has an allergic reaction to sin. That's his nature. So holiness, a holy God cannot tolerate sin. Holiness expels sin, kind of like a sneeze. So why hasn't this happened yet? Well, it's because now is the time of God's favor. He is delaying the inevitable. He is holding off on the sneeze, so to speak, that will eventually expel every sinner from his presence. Now, from our perspective, he's been holding off on the sneeze for a long time, but not for the eternal God. In love, he's just holding off for a little while from his perspective. But the sneeze is coming. It might be tomorrow, which makes every day the day of salvation. 
a day when yet another person can take the remedy that allows sinful people like us to be in the presence of a holy God without him expelling us. That solution is Jesus Christ. So every morning that we wake up, we open our eyes, we wiggle our toes. It's because the time of God's favor has extended at least one more day. Why has he extended his favor day after day after day? Well, if we haven't been saved yet, his favor has been extended today so that we might have at least one more day, one more chance to say yes to Jesus Christ. And if we have already said yes to Jesus Christ, he has extended one more day of favor, one more day of life, so that we might have at least one more day to help someone else say yes to Jesus Christ. Now, these first two verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 that we've been talking about are really the closing statement of the previous chapter, chapter 5. And in that chapter, chapter 5, we are given a title and a description of our daily assignment in this time of God's favor. Here's here's how it's described. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20 says, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We are Christ's ambassadors. Webster defines an ambassador this way. An ambassador is the resident representative of their government or a sovereign. Why a resident representative? I mean, why not just send an email? Why does the U.S., for example, send ambassadors to actually live in the places where they want representation? Well, it's because people are impacted not just by information. People are impacted mostly by relationships. So a good ambassador is engaged in and aware of the place where they're living and the culture and the people that they're representing. They don't just tell people, for example, in another nation what the U.S. thinks. They help them understand it. God wants ambassadors for the same purpose, the same reason. The words in the Bible are most powerful when they're explained by someone who is living them, who is trying to live them, and who knows and cares about the person they're trying to explain these words to. Now, in the verses that precede this verse, the ambassador verse, we are given the profile of an ambassador of Christ. And we discover that Christ's ambassadors have two motives. They're moved by two things. They're guided by one perspective, and they speak one message. First, the two motives. A motive is what moves us, what motivates us. Ambassadors of Christ reach out to those who do not know Jesus Christ for two primary reasons. The first is the fear of the Lord. This answers the question, is this real to you or not? Is this salvation that Jesus offers something that you perceive to be real, or is it just some kind of religious idea? 2 Corinthians 5.11 says this, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. It's because we fear the Lord that we persuade people. Now, the fear of the Lord is a phrase that's used throughout the Bible to describe those who take God very seriously. It doesn't mean that they're terrified of God, but to them, defying God is about as smart as jumping off a cliff. It's a healthy kind of fear, rooted in their understanding of what's real and therefore what has consequences to it. For example, gravity is real. That's why people fear gravity, and they they don't defy it. In the same way, if we fear God, then we believe that God is real and we don't defy him. To a person who fears the Lord, the words in the Bible are really a matter of life and death. There are real consequences to them. Twenty years ago, my brother-in-law died unexpectedly, leaving his wife and four children under the age of 11 with no life insurance. He actually had a policy on his desk that he was going to, he was partially filled out and had never signed. And so I have seen over the last 20 years firsthand how devastating it is to die without providing life insurance for your family. So if you get me in a conversation, especially with maybe a young father, about life insurance, I'm going to be pretty bold. In fact, I might even bring the conversation up and ask them if they have life insurance. Why? It's because life insurance has moved from just a good idea that I agree people should have to something that I've seen with my own eyes and experienced the devastation of not having it. It's become real to me. So if we could spend just 10 minutes in the next life, we would be very motivated, ambassadors. 
we would see how real this is. You know, if we could just get a glimpse of heaven, just a short visit, and then a glimpse of what it's like to spend eternity apart from God in hell, just a brief visit, if we could actually see the line of people standing before Christ at the end, getting ready to have their entire life evaluated, and then look into their eyes, if we could just get a glimpse of these things, we would know this is real. We would have no problem being motivated, but we can't do that. So how can this become real to us, as real as what we see? The only way that occurs this side of eternity is by deciding every single day to treat what God says in the Bible as real, to make our decisions by what it says. This is called living by faith, not just by sight. To live by faith doesn't mean You just have a feeling. What it means is you make your decisions based on what God has said, not just on what you see. So here's what we read in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 7 through 10. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him For the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Faith lives every single day with the understanding that we will, as it says here, appear before Jesus to give an account of our life. And that's because he is real. So if the pattern of your life, I mean, we all struggle to do what is right, but if the pattern of your life is to defy what God has said in some area of your life and to choose to do what is wrong in God's eyes, what that means is you do not fear the Lord. Now, you fear what you can see. You take what you can see seriously, probably. That's why you don't jump off cliffs and drive on the wrong side of the road. That's real, and therefore the consequences are real. But you're not convinced that God is real. You don't take him seriously. And if that's the case, if that's the pattern of your life, that means that talking about Jesus is going to feel kind of like you're selling life insurance, not like you're really saving somebody's life, because you're not convinced that this is really real. The second motive is the love of Christ. The first motive is the fear of the Lord. That answers the question, do we really think this is real? The second motive answers the question, do we care, do we love the people around us with the kind of love that Christ has? 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15 says this, for Christ's love compels us, it moves us, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore we all died together with him then. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. If you were to ask most Christians, why did Jesus die? They would tell you to pay the debt for our sin, and they would be right. But that's only part of the story. The debt being paid, the forgiveness being offered, is is just part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. As it says here, he also died So that we would, in a sense, die to doing life our own way, and we would now live for him. It's almost as if we've died and we've gotten a glimpse of heaven, and now we're living differently because we have a different agenda. We're trying to follow him. The problem is a lot of Christians never really move beyond the forgiveness part of why Jesus died. In a sense, they're kind of like ambassadors that are focused primarily on the perk of diplomatic immunity. You know, if you're an ambassador in another country and you get a speeding ticket, it's thrown away. You're forgiven. If you commit a crime, it's forgiven because you have diplomatic immunity. You are forgiven. And it's kind of the same with followers of Jesus Christ. They're ambassadors of Christ, and therefore, they are forgiven. They can sin and be forgiven. But what would you think of an ambassador in another country that's in the job primarily for diplomatic immunity? That's the perk. That's the primary thing they're focused on you would say that's, you've missed the whole point of what it means to be an ambassador. Having received Christ's love, the whole point now is that we would share it. Not just that we would take advantage of the forgiveness that we've been offered, but that we would share it with other people. And if we don't do that, if we're not a part of that, that means we've missed the point of why God forgave us in the first place. So those are the two motives. The one perspective that is true of an ambassador of Christ is this. They realize that we are living in tents. Right now, we're living in tents. Here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. 
Now, we think of tents very differently than ancient people thought of tents. For us, tents are recreational. I mean, we go on camping trips and we set up tents to get away from everything and because it's fun. For them, tents were not fun. They were a necessity until they could gather together enough resources and enough time to build a house. And until that time, while they were living in tents, they and their families were less protected from the dangers of the elements and from the wildlife and from the marauders of the ancient world. And so, therefore, their goal was to not waste any more money than was absolutely needed while they were living in the tent so that they could prepare for and work on the more permanent structure. The point that's being made here is this is what our life is like right now. We are living in the tent phase of life, not the house phase. And what that means is our top priority should be to use this tent time to prepare for and get ready to move into the eternal house. The problem is we can't see the house being built. We can't see heaven. We can only see the tent. So it's really easy for us to live just for the tent, to spend all of our time and all of our resources on tent maintenance and tent upgrades and maybe tent expansions. Now, we can't, and we, in fact, shouldn't ignore the tent. We need to take care of the tent. We need to pay for the tent. We need to fix up the tent. We need to clean the tent. And we might need to get a bigger tent. But a tent perspective on life helps us never get too upset when we have a problem with the tent, when we find a hole in the tent, because, well, that's part of what tent life involves. Tents are fragile. They're flimsy. This past week, one day I looked at the news feed on my phone, and these were the, the top four stories in my feed. Here's the first story. The title was Dire Models. The U.S. is opening anyways. The second story title was, Is the Virus Getting More Dangerous? The third title was, Worst Ever Jobs Report. The fourth title was, Some People Will Never Leave Home. Speaking of how fear has gripped so many people because of this virus. Now, I didn't end up reading these stories, but just looking at the titles, I was starting to sink into depression already. I mean, this, this news is just consuming. But you have to realize all of these problems, while everyone is saying this is the biggest thing in the world, these are tent problems. Right now, we've got a bug in the tent. It's actually a virus. And obviously, it appears to be a pretty bad one. And we can't ignore it. But I believe that one of God's purposes in this time is to get us to look beyond the tent so that we might prepare for the heavenly dwelling. I mean, tents have never been safe. Tents have never been uh, the refuge that we would like them to be. And that's what we're experiencing now. We're not near as safe as we thought we were. So a tent perspective on this life not only changes what's important in this life, it also changes how we see people. Here's what we see in 2 Corinthians 5.16. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So the Apostle Paul who's writing this is saying that once he understood that Christ was our only hope of salvation after this earthly tent is gone, it changed his perspective on everyone he saw. As it says, he no longer regarded people from a worldly point of view. What's a worldly point of view? Well, it's basically seeing people without any concern for the condition of their soul. Seeing a neighbor and a co-worker or a customer as just that and nothing more. But what we have to realize is that's just the tent. What's inside the tent is a soul. A soul made in the image of God that is marching towards an eternity one day at a time, either eternity with God because of Christ or eternity without God because of their sin. And that should raise a question in our mind as we talk with people, as we interact with people, is I wonder what's going on inside the tent. I wonder if they know about God's love for them and his offer of forgiveness in Christ. That's a different perspective. And that brings us to the message. Ambassadors of Christ have one message. And as ambassadors, we need to know what to say, how to explain to people how they can be reconciled with God and made right with him. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 19 says this, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. So it says God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ. He is putting things back together in our relationship. Because of Christ, our sin can be paid for, and we can be made right with God. But what it says is he has committed to us a very critical part of this effort, and that is the message. And what that means is if we don't open our mouths and tell people about this, there's a good chance they won't hear about it. Now, that's a pretty shocking thought. I mean, with all that's at stake, why would God commit such a critical part to us? I mean, I can see giving us a small part of the message job, maybe to get us involved, but all of it? That's why the message is so important, and that's why we need to know the message and be able to communicate the message. I want to show you a brief video that I think is a great summary of the message of how we can be made, made with, right with God through Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at this. How has COVID-19 impacted you? In the wake of the pandemic, many people are experiencing invisible but very real side effects. For some of us, it's a post-earthquake syndrome. Our sense of security has been shaken. Our jobs, finances, and safety are less stable than before. And amid the mess, we're looking for meaning and purpose. For others, it's the new claustrophobia. Our house seems smaller each day. With our family now together 24-7, we feel pressed between job responsibilities and relationship tensions. At times, sadness, anger, and fear close in around us. We feel trapped. The symptoms we are feeling are actually just the tip of the iceberg of our much larger need for rescue. We are adrift, cut off from the resources we need to experience meaning, purpose, love, and peace. We hope to hear the sound of a helicopter bringing a rescuer. Human beings weren't always in need of this rescue. God created the first man and woman to know him and to experience his friendship, care, and love. He showed them how to live so they could make choices that would lead to life in all its fullness. However, Adam and Eve rebelled against God's direction. They chose to do life their own way. And everyone since then chose life their own way, which is sin. As a result, we live in guilt and separation from God. The gap between us and God is too great. There are just not enough good deeds that we could do to restore the relationship. But out of his infinite and extreme love, God didn't let it end there. At an astounding cost to himself, he took the initiative and made a way for us to be rescued. About 2,000 years ago, God sent his son Jesus to earth to show us how to live God's way, how to find the meaning and purpose we've lost. Jesus took upon himself the sin and guilt of all mankind as he died a horrific death on the cross. His death paid our penalty, making a way for us to connect to God. Three days later, Jesus resurrected, came back to life, proving he is God. If we stop trying to live life our own way and commit to Jesus as Lord of our life, he provides everything we need to experience the truly full life now and eternal life with him forever. It's been almost 2,000 years since Jesus' resurrection. Since then, billions of people claim they have experienced the reality of Jesus rescuing them. They tell of a personal relationship with a loving God, strength and peace amidst turmoil, healing of inner hurt, and power and direction for navigating crisis. If you were in physical peril, just imagine how grateful you would be to be found by a strong and competent rescuer. The Bible describes Jesus as a rescuer, seeking us, coming to us individually, saying, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Accepting Jesus' rescue parallels physical rescue, which involves agreeing you need the rescue believing the rescuer has the power to save you, and committing to do what your rescuer says. If you're ready to open the door to Jesus and accept his rescue, it is necessary to agree you have chosen to do life your own way and ask God for forgiveness. Believe Jesus came to earth and died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. 
commit to accept Jesus' offer of rescue and respond to him for who he is, Lord, in charge of everything and your boss for how you live each day. If you're ready to accept Jesus' rescue, you can pray, talk to God, telling him something like this, Lord Jesus, I believe you are God. Thank you for dying for my sins so that I can be forgiven. I yield control of my life to you. Come into my life and make me into the person you want me to be. Thank you for giving me eternal life. So let me ask you two questions. The first question is, have you accepted Jesus' rescue offer? Have you personally accepted this offer in Christ? Today, as we've been talking about, is the day of salvation. We don't know about tomorrow. Today is the day of salvation. So I would encourage you, don't delay on this. If you have questions, work to get them answered, but don't delay on this. Second question is, do you know someone well enough that you could share this video with them? Someone, as far as you know, have not accepted the offer of Christ. Now, to share this video, you can just look at the link to the video in the description that's below. Now, let me say this. Don't blast this out on your Facebook feed. You are an ambassador, not just a broadcaster of information. What that means is I would encourage you to pray about who you know well enough to share this with, who might benefit from this, and how might you share this with them, and then do that. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for all of the plans and all of the work that you went into to reconcile us to yourself. You could have expelled us from your presence and been done with it, but out of your love, you planned to rescue us. And Jesus, we, we thank you for the price that you paid to rescue us. And we pray that you would help us as ambassadors to see what's really at stake here, to understand the consequences, to take you seriously, and to look at people around us differently, the way you see them, the way you love them. And Father, we just ask that you would give us the opportunity to bring up a conversation and to share maybe this video link or really serve someone that might eventually turn into an opportunity for a deeper conversation. God, we pray you'd give us insight. There's a lot of pressure going on in everyone's life, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to talk about these matters because of what's going on. So I just pray that you'd give us eyes to see people the way you see them. And we pray this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing one last song now. So it's actually about the day of salvation when God called our name and moved us out of darkness into his wonderful light. So join us as we sing this song. Sing, I was buried, I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my soul till I met you. I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide He was my tomb Till I met you You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Now 
your mercy has saved my soul now your freedom is all that I know the old man you Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. of the darkness into your glorious day I needed rescue my sin was heavy the chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven When I was broken, you were my healing Now your love is the air that I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open Cause when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness to your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great week.